Right, so I, I, I gave you this uh, intro the other day where I wanted to frame at the start just how important stories are. And I added some more material here, right? We had a question, I think, from Todd, right? So this was not supposed to be exhaustive. It's like I'm throwing some things up, but I've added you know, religion here, of course. Uh, was a massive one that's here. Freemasonry, I'll put that down. Um, uh, I actually grew up in an area where Freemasonry was quite strong. You know, everyone, it turned out, was a Freemason. Um, and they tried to recruit you at some point. So, uh, strange business. Except women, of course, they did not recruit women. Um, okay. They said they were very inclusive. Uh, so, all sorts of that, right? So, the stories for countries, cities, all sorts of groups that are coherent uh, in some way. Right. And they're, they're, they're kind of they're competing storytelling entities. And a lot of these stories are about how to live your life. Not all of them. Went through this Pantheon piece, which was to show that over time, and I, I think maybe especially this image showed the rise of the storyteller as this really important key part of society. And, and you know, sports, in a way, give us this very spontaneous storytelling thing. Okay, so let's move on to some other pieces. These are recent books. I just wanted to highlight these. You might be interested in them, but they have different framing. So this is a, I know I mentioned this the other day, this is the evolution of stories. I'm right? talking about them in a uh, kind of a um, Darwinian kind of way. No, it doesn't fit exactly. So meme, the word meme comes from, so people know where it comes from? It's Richard Dawkins, right? It's the... Um, the Selfish Gene, that book, introduced the, he introduced the idea of meme, and it's supposed to be this cultural unit. Um, which, you know, and I think that, I kind of think the better framing is, is more, more generally story. Of course, memes have become a meme, right? They've survived. They are a cultural unit now, but they mean ridiculous little videos, right? So that's what everyone thinks of memes. You know, I've had 12-year-olds explain to me what memes are when I tried to tell them about Dawkins. Anyway, but it um, didn't go well. <laughs> like, but anyway, so uh, I will say that the whole interest in this is a side thing, but all the stuff about cooperation and selfishness, and you'll see a lot of work uh, where cooperation is framed as this kind of extraordinary thing that emerges in large populations, and how do we study it? And it's very much to me the it, the opposite is the interesting thing, right? So people are cooperative locally, and they create these large groups that are very. Um, non-cooperative with respect to other large groups. And that's our big concern. I mean, people have um, generally, except for sociopaths, have uh, built in you know, social tendencies to reciprocate and do all these sorts of things with each other. OK, and it's more at that larger scale. And then I think the final part in that little story is that uh, the interest in cooperation of individuals, like why do individuals cooperate with each other, comes from people who are sociopaths, right? So they're economists and so on, right? So, um, because their world is one that's, sorry, their, their world is one that, uh, you know, they've defeated all of their foes as they got tenure and so on. So they don't understand cooperation. Um, anyway, whereas most normal people do. So this is, uh, this, then this is a different framing. This is about how, you know, that stories are essential to us. There's, there's any number of these books, you know, why, why salt transformed the world, why, you know, the mollusk made America great. You know, like there's all these sorts of books, right? There's millions of books that have this kind of framing of, you know, why chickens are, you know, the reason for the existence of whatever, you know. Anyway. They get carried away. But I do think this is really a powerful one. Everything matters. I mentioned this again too. Uh, this thing, I know we watched this, but I kind of want to watch this again because I want you to, I, I so the big triangle is in this space to start with, right? So you could listen. So these, they, this, they could be thieves, for example, right? The sound, I'm not sure about. The, it seems unnecessary, right? So there's, they, they come, and I don't think I, when I was watching again, I missed that. But um, see, going in to steal some things, maybe. Anyway, and at the end, and I'm not, I have trouble speeding this up. Can I do that? No, I can't speed up. At the end, the big triangle smashes everything to pieces. So worth watching again and maybe reading that paper. Okay, so let's have a definition of a story. So this is very milky and not necessarily, you know, finished at all. I mean, all of this is developmental. That's what I'm kind of showing you, although there are some pieces in the next three lectures that are very well established, you know. So I'm trying to tie a lot of things together. 
So I'm going to say a story of some sequence of uh, events. It's, and and I'm, it doesn't have to be, but I think temporal, you know, there's some temporal, right? There's some aspect, at least, of causality usually involved, right? There's some logic to it. So that's a simple thing. And it can be just a, like, if then, you know, if this, then that. It can be just a tiny little algorithmic step, right? And so that, that's where, and I'll say this again, we get to proverbs, for example, you know. Little, little, tiny little, and they can be more in the form of, you know, telling you how to behave, but they're like little microscopic stories. So they go from small to very, very large. Uh, events, of course, can be any, you know, balance of, of real and imagined ones. And, and often uh, with us, we can't help but throw in some imagined things. We love that sort of stuff. Uh, I mean, it is peculiar to me in some ways that, I mean, I think wonderful perhaps, that the most, you know, totally fictional works are the most powerful for us in some ways. Um, I think I'll have something more to say about that. Yeah. You know, things that are completely made up or in a sense, you know, they could be about aliens or whatever, but they, they, they can have great effects on us. So I think this is generally thought to be reasonable that when people talk about narratives and stories, they, they, they're using them interchangeably, right? There are, you know, I, I, again, people can make up all sorts of definitions here, but that's fairly solid. This, I've just stolen this from Wikipedia, actually. But whereas a plot is a different thing. So a plot is the underlying logic of a story, right? And there's some arguments about all sorts of things here. Um, there's a Russian framing of very much this, this, this idea that there's a plot in a story, that there's something that really happens and then as a story gets told about it. But of course, and there's a lot of postmodernism criticism of that because this goes back the other way, right? So you hear this and then you start to deduce things about plot. And of course, if you're trying to do anything, uh, you know, disinformation and so on, this is just a field day for you, right? Because you can sort of insinuate all sorts of things happened underneath by not exactly saying them. Uh, but the idea of the plot is that it's, uh, that there are causal links, right? This is a so and a so, right? One causes four, causes eight, but you know, you tell all these things. Uh, it doesn't have to be in the same time order. If you, maybe you've seen Memento, it's an older film now, but, um, you know, that, or, you know, Pulp Fiction, right? I mean, these, these things are not in time order um, or in kind of any ethical order as well, but uh, they're, you know, very disturbing or anything to do with Doctor Who, which makes no sense whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> time travelers, wow, that is, that is a bad business for stories, but people, we, can't, we can't help ourselves. I have a piece about that. I should write that down. I'll see if I can dig that up. I mean, it's really a fiasco um, in, in, uh, in stories. Nothing makes sense. Except for, is it Looper? No, what's it called? Is it Looper? What's the book? Looper? No, no, no. Back to the Future is, of course, but um, and it's pretty good, you know. Doc Brown with the explanation on the board. Yeah. One point twenty one. What's that? The one I've got. You know, I'll have it here. I'll show. I'll, I'll, I'll have it here. I, do, I know it's on a on a thing. It's a very deep effort to try and make it actually work. All right. So I'll, I'll make this as assignation plot and algorithms are the same, sort of in the same bucket, right? So they. And I know people have very different ideas potentially about algorithm, but I feel like we can do that. We're all set. We're all set. OK. All right, so hopefully you acted independently. The next plan here, thank you, is to good. So now we're going to go around again. That's the second column is for you to look at what everyone else has done. And now collect this is different, right? So the winning the delicious chocolate arm, coated almonds is the first column. This one is a team effort. We're going to try and get it as close as we can to the real answer. So you want to use what the collective intelligence of everyone else and, and put in what you think is the, the best answer. <laughs> so now you can game it however you want, right? It's going to be the average. Well, maybe I'll take the medium, but it's going to be the average of the second column. It's going to be our best effort, right? So you're trying to get the right thing. You don't have to think too much about this, but basically look through it. Look at your thing, you know, were you super high, were you super low, whatever. Or, you know, and if you think everyone is wrong, Neptune is your thing, parsecs are your thing, you know all about it, then you hold fast, right? So it's up to you. This is, but, but
But what you want is the average to work out. So do as you will. And so just work them through and, and pass them on. All right, good. OK, so I'm going to say this, plot an algorithm. I'm going to sort of connect those things together. But this is, a, I think, a, a, a fairly general, I mean, obviously, very general definition of story. Time is involved, right? There's some time aspect here. Um, I know you could still describe something flatly, but uh, even then, there's a ordering that you're forced because you're telling it. You know, you, there's time running as you either read the book or you or someone tells a story. So we're trying to work. I think uh, you know many people now. I think are sort of getting on board with stories. You see it framed in all sorts of ways. Uh, we just had this science of story symposium, which was great. We had you know folklore people, all sorts of people coming in. Uh, so I don't know what we'll end up calling, but a science of stories of some sort. And, and you know, if we go back in time, right, the rise of propaganda led to communication departments. Actually, the Second World War, and, and as far as I understand, talking to the sort of many, I guess, the famous folklore people in the US, folklore departments have gone away. There's only one PhD left, uh, and that's at Indiana. I believe that's right. And the story is it's, the, it's because of um, the Second World War, because of Nazism. It, it got looked down upon because you know, folklore was used as, in this negative way. But it seems a, a, lo a real loss to sort of just say, let's not study this anymore. Let's not you know, think about it. So, um, so there's, been, you know, th there's been a sort of a, a descent in that area. OK. Uh, so, you know, claim, claim and, uh, and as I showed with these books, right, that, that um, you know, people run on stories. I have this thing, homo narrativus. Uh, these are just some fun things, right? We use stories all the time. What's the John Dory, right? That's the sort of theme for this class that uh, rhymes with story. That's actually a very common, when I, at least when I was in Australia, that people would say that all the time. What's the story? You know, like, what's the story with this thing? What's, you know, they'd say, what, in, even, even in, um, you know, saying hello. And, and you would say, what's the John Dory? Uh, you talk about someone losing the plot or the thread, right? When they've gone off the reservation or whatever's happened to them, um, they've you know lost the the story. So those three bullet points are you know, just around the idea that we are storytelling entities. Uh, narrative hierarchy is a, another piece I have here. Maybe we can talk about that. But uh, scalability of stories, right? So I guess it's it's captured here. So the, not the best stories, but really strong stories are going to have like a uh, a condensed version up here, you know, and this will be two, two words, three words that somehow capture it, right? So this is your slogan or your catchphrase out to some deep body of work. And, uh, the, you know, so this is an example where these things don't fit together, right? This is some basically lies being told about some true thing. Uh, and the idea is to fit them together if you can, right? So. Uh, and this is really about knowledge, right? So that you are actually telling something really condensed that's, that's true here, but of course it's only two or three words. So let's see, I have a whole piece on this. And I don't really know how to you know, make this work properly, right? But I have 10 levels here of, of stories. So there's you know, one, one to two, three word encapsulation, um, right? The Big Bang, for example. That's good work by physicists, even though we don't understand it. Um, <laughs> But it you know, tells you something. Then, then sentences, a few sentences right out to a paragraph. Uh, log lines for movies, that's how movies are stored. Or you know, there's a one or two sentence paraphrasing of it. Uh, you know, and this, uh, OK, and then out to these things, right? So out to a, like a large coherent body of work, which is like the Marvel Universe or religious scripts, a number of things, right? And then some stuff here about how these things do or don't work and the misuse of them, right? So disinformation. Um, yep, yep, yep. Anyway, I think this is a kind of a big deal. So perhaps the way things, and I'm, this is the way things are being talked about now, uh, is that the, the left is, is actually bad at this, right? They're bad at this part, you know? Trumped up, trickle down economics was a line that Clinton used in one of the debates. And it's just like, she was trying to like wham him. And it's like, oof, that's, it just, it just doesn't have the, it didn't have rhetorical strength. Um, and, and it's not to say they don't, right? So they, they can have all of this, but they're having trouble 
And so there's, there is a sort of a framing now that the left can't meme, but the right can meme. And, you know, I don't know. They, they definitely need some work, right? They definitely need some work, right? So, and we'll come to one of the, these frames later on, but uh, uh, the original, I'm just talking about slogans and, and they're not everything, but they're, they're very important. So Clinton's first one was, um, I'm with her, which isn't, you know, about the ascent of uh, uh, a country or something, right? It's just, you know, it, it's, it's a weird framing. And then it was stronger together after that. There, there's also whether the, the framing can be used against you, right? Like flipped in some way, right? Can it be mocked, you know, badly? Can you, can you make them sound ridiculous? So, um, uh, so in Australia, there's a long time ago in the 90s, the, uh, the Labor Party, which is the left-wing party, was, had been in for many years and, it, you know, things had gone to pieces. They were going to get voted out for sure. And ridiculously, what's called the Liberal Party in Australia, which is the right side, um, all they had to do was just turn up, right? They had to just say nothing, just smile and nod. It was one of those situations. This happens, you know, periodically in countries where you just don't say anything, right? Because the other team has made such a mess that you'll get voted in. So idiotically, they decided to, you know, frame a whole thing that they were going to build for the country, and they called it the Fight Back Package. And the uh, Prime Minister at the time, Paul Keating, got up in Parliament and, for Monty Python fans, did the whole dead parrot sketch and just use the word package every time he was supposed to say parrot. And he recited it from memory, basically. And so it's parliament system. One side is laughing and just, you know, killing themselves, and the other side is jeering and so on. And, and you know, it's like some sort of bad kindergarten situation. But this is how it works in the parliament system. And they lost, you know, they lost, right? They lost. The, the, the liberals lost. They should have just walked straight in, said nothing about what they were going to do. Um, Anyway, they, they made something that could be pilloried, and, and it was, and it's all just words. But you've got, to be, you've got to be incredibly careful. All right, so this is just one slide to say that are trying to build the science of stories. And, and you know, a number of you are sort of working on Twitter things. Um, you know, we're up to 10 years of that, but that's, that's, that's just part of it, right? So how do we get all these things out of text? Metaphors, for example, like that's just, that's an uns that's, there are only a few papers on this recently, you know, in the last five years. It's a really hard problem. I uh, had a great student in Parks work on this uh, at some point. Very tough. How do we just get out narrative? How do we get out the, not just, so here's sort of the story. That's what we're trying to do with this thing called Story Wrangler. Here's the, uh, you know, here's an event that happened in the world and how is it being framed, right? How many different dimensions of, of stories are being told about it? Uh, you know, and we're, we're for some of the things that have happened more recently in time, we, I think we're getting to a point where we're very aware of what will happen. Like, you know, Parkland, for example, um, uh, that the, the idea of crisis actor was right there, right? So that, that, and that emerged the next day. It was all over YouTube, all of these videos that, that claimed this. Um, you know, these are, so in terms of predictability, I suppose we're getting there with some of these things, but being able to actually detect in real time disinformation Right, these different frames, we should be able to do it. And I know I've showed you little bits of this in the, in the past. What's the taxonomy of human stories? I'll come back to this later on. Like what's the, what's the for a particular culture, what are the kinds of stories they go back to over and over again? Again, what are the stories that they can understand? You know, there's this general idea that the West is good at individual stories and the East is better at collective stories. I mean, incredibly important for cultures and how they, they run. And this idea of stories and algorithms. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so they're everywhere. I'm going to say algorithms are everywhere. This is a uh, so there's a recent paper talking about what we need to think about stories in economics, right? Think about how people behave. This is um, for economists. You might want to look at this one. Um, you know, and this is now thinking about more about the algorithm aspect. You know, legal systems are full of algorithms, right? So if you do this, then this happens. Uh, well, I'll come back to that with adjacent narratives. Um, lots, of, lots of algorithmic structures. Food, the way food works. Safety codes, all these sorts of things. And I'm going to say stories. So this is, you know, we had all this success with calculus and differential equations describing all of these um, continuous phenomena, which are everywhere, right? I mean, they're, we, fluids, for example, which I'll come back to at the end of the course, is a ubiquitous phenomenon and we have this kind of amazing way we, we've come to understand we can just des describe it with the Navier-Stokes equations. 
it's an unbelievable success in terms of understanding complex systems. Um, but the right, as you go through the evolution of uh, a universe, if things keep going, then algorithms, algorithms, algorithms take over, right? It's a lift from raw physics and randomness and so on into algorithmic behaviors. And really, the advent of life is the start of algorithms. So more about algorithms, right? So this is, again, these are all really recent things, which I, you know, this is, this is stuff that's super taking off. So this is a, this is seeing the economic phenomena as, as code, right? Um, this is, so these are, these are very nice. So this one is how to learn, uh, helping you learn computer science by talking about folklore or stories, uh, folk stories or um, folk tales. So, for example, you know, Hansel and Gretel is a search problem and leaving crumbs and all this sort of stuff. So how is that done versus, you know, other ways to search things? That's them there, I suppose, they're, they're little crumbs. So this is, a, this is for a computer science class, right? So you can understand algorithms better by talking about stories. And then this is the other way around. These are taking all sorts of computer science algorithms that have been developed to solve all sorts of problems and then how to use them in your own life or whatever organization you're in. And I think this is done. This is done very, very well. It's not like, you know, everything should be. It's just like here. Oh, look, look. Here's some stuff we, uh, you know, figured out how to, you know, search problems, um, <laughs> how to s sequence things, all sorts of stuff that really matter and are really, you know, important in, in, in computer science. And it's all emerged over the last what 70 years. Uh, and you, know, you can use this. You know. Right, cooking, right? I know I had that on the other page, but cooking, recipes, yeah? And that's, that pops up here, right? So I have it here, yes. Numerical Rep Recipes in C, very famous book, Numerical Recipes in Fortran. I don't know if they keep making them. Do they have them in Python? But these are actually, these are actually some of the best books there are around for, um, for understanding algorithms, for understanding like some statistical packages and so on or statistical techniques, I should say. There's like two or three pages where they describe it and then they have the algorithm. And, but the framing of these, these algorithms being recipes. Um, and then this is how to bake pie. Okay, this is, uh, this is math through, um, uh, thinking about mathematical, actually it's more about math stuff, pure math, um, through, through recipes. Very enjoyable, well done. Okay, so, just giving you things, right? So adjacent narratives. So this is something I keep trying to understand for myself. Um, and I'm just sort of constructing this. So this is the story versus perhaps plot a little bit, but it's, it's a departure from that in some ways, right? So this, if you can see this, there's this gray, these gray dots in the background. And that, they're the same for all of these, right? There's this little pattern here, and it's really this one. Right, in the middle there. So that's, let's say this is something that truly happened, right? These are some events that happened. I'm not gonna have multiverse, whatever, nonsense and things. Like this, the, this was a sequence of events, the causal in some way. And so these, these are then retellings or versions of this, this story, right? So this one, you know, actually has the, the same events in it, but misses these ones and adds a few different ones and connects them, right, for example. This one has a completely different track that ends up with the same story. This one just tells you piecemeal. Uh, this one's completely off in terms of it. This one starts in the same way and then they depart. And then there are all these events around, this is just to sort of show there are all these events around the actual events, which connects to this picture, which is that there's an infinitude of stories adjacent to the real one. All right, so this, so I have the three points I wanna make about this. But this is in a sense, kind of a great beauty of stories, but it's a hu huge problem for us when it comes especially to disinformation and, and just getting things wrong, is that, you know, just take Moby Dick and just change one sentence, right? Just change one sentence a little bit and then do that to every sentence. Maybe not call me Ishmael, but like change little things, right? So, and then change maybe two sentences and it's a combinatorial explosion, right? There's an um, and this is not, not changing it in any substantive way, just little tiny bits. So you get to an, an ex combinatorial explosion of stories that are, that are essentially the same story, right? I mean, if you're just changing tiny pieces. But then you can make the whale a kraken or something like that, right? You could start to change it and you could call it Floyd, 
right? You could, you could give it a different feel. And then it could be, you know, a, about, you know, snakes in Australia or something, like the giant snake that gets you. It could, right, completely different thing. You know, and we're good at trans, you know, with the stories we really like, like West Side Story is Romeo and Juliet. You know, we're good at um, the ones we really like. We'll, we'll be able to place them in different, different spaces. Uh, so there's, there, are the, there, are, there are tiny modifications that show that this just explodes. Like if you think of the bull, if you like, in mathematical or, or, or sort of the adjacent, what I'm going to say, this adjacent narratives, it's unbelievably rich and, and full. And so a couple of things arise from that. This is, this is the story that gets told by the person who can't sort out meaning, right? They just go on detours, which I guess you might think is me, but they go on to detours and explain all these little extra pieces, right? Um, it doesn't happen as much anymore, but you know, people with directions, you know, you ask like, how do you get from A to B? And some people will, you know, they tell you exactly, you know, just enough. And then there'll be the person who says, you know, and then you go past, there's a red mailbox. Now the person who lives in that house came from, you know, and they just, just tell me how to get there. You know, like, <laughs> um, so, you know, figuring out how to tell your story, you know, like that's the narrative hierarchy. You've got, you know, there's the elevator pitch idea, right? You know, what, what's the, What's the circumstance? Here we have 75 minutes, so I will cruelly say as much as I want. But, uh, you know, if we had five minutes, you'd just go and you'd adjust. Some people don't adjust, they don't care, you know. So that possibly explains your Thanksgiving dinner with um, whoever. All right. Uh, so this is what I'm going to say about uh, the, this kind of just observation of this infinitude of stories around a true one. So the first thing is, you can't write this kind of, you can't record a real story, right? We can, we're getting close with some events with video where it becomes somewhat harder to say different things happened. Although, amazingly, that's not entirely the case, right? It's like, you know, there's actual video of something and it's still argued about, you know? Or like giant pictures of like crowd sizes, for example. You know, like stuff to which, which you would, it's not just words anymore, right? It's actual pictures and things, but we, we, we're, we're pretty good. And of course, we, we're entering into a very dangerous time where we can potentially certainly manipulate images, but video is kind of coming, right? The, these sort of things where you can make, I mean, there are, there's, thank you, deep learning. There are efforts to like make, uh, you know, say a president say anything you want, right? Or, like actually visually say it. And those things are not great yet from what I've seen, right? They don't look good, they don't, they're not convincing. But people are clever and relentless one day, and you could potentially make a video of anyone you want saying anything you want. For now, we have an emoji on, on iPhones, you know, and that's, <laughs> we think that's awesome. Although, you know, <laughs> I did want to replace my whole course with an an emoji thing, but it only goes for 10 seconds, but anyway. <laughs> so disappointing. Uh, <clears throat> you know, clean up the. <laughs> So, uh, okay, so you can't re record every detail, right? I'm gonna give you three things. You can't record every detail. That's just gonna be impossible. Even with video, you know, you can't have every aspect or whatever it is. So that's fine, that's always been true. Um, so you're gonna be compressing in some way as well because you've got, you know, so many words to, to, to con you know, uh, convey the thing. There are many other things to talk about, so as time goes on, you know, if we look back in history, I think there's an interesting thing, like we can sort of remember, not everything survives, of course, but you know, we'll say for a whole century, this is the thing that happened basically, right? You know, now we have this incredible density of, of stuff. Um, <clears throat> that's just a bias, of course. So story logic will be favored on top of that, right? So we're gonna leave out kind of weird little random details. We're gonna miss them. I mean, there's all sorts of psychological stuff about this. Um, work on this, uh, we're, we're good at missing things if they don't make any sense. Like the, the famous one is the, it, does this hold up? I have to ask the resident psychologist. The gorilla walking around amongst people, has that been reproduced? It's been reproduced a lot, a lot but I think that most people sort of are aware of. They know it. Do you know about this one? Have you heard of this one? So it's, I'll just, yeah, it's worth watching because I, I think people still have trouble with it, right? Like. There are six people on a basketball court and they're just passing a ball. So three are passing it one way and three are passing the other way. So it's just the two circles kind of like this. I think roughly something like that. This is just sort of a, like this stuff going on. Yeah, there's movement. Like people are moving around while they're passing basketball. 
And you're supposed to just watch that, right? right. That's all you're asked no, you're to do. You're supposed to count how many times oh, you, the ball passes. Okay, you're given a task, right? Yeah. And then someone in a gorilla suit just walks through the whole thing. Just walks through it. And what percentage of people, like? Low, most people miss it. Most people miss this. They like just do not see it, right? They just do not see it. And then you can watch it again and they'll still miss it because they're <laughs> concentrating on this task. I mean, this is why you shouldn't text and drive, right? I mean, because we, you know, we've only so much we can, we can do. And I know Pratchett's sort of my favorite author, Terry Pratchett, but he has, you know, death is a character in Pratchett and uh, he simply walks amongst people, right? And uh, the issue with death is no one, no one is gonna see a seven foot grim reaper. So they just fill it in with normality, except children and cats, yeah. Their brains are not whatever. But you know, adults, we're really good at just like, ah, that did, that's, not, that's not even, that's just, that's just a tree. <laughs> Sorry. If, yes. So the, if the real story, is there like a real story that exists in a cave? Is that distinct from? I'm, I'm going to say there was a sequence of events in history, right? There really, you know, things really happened. Like a tree really fell in the forest and it really did make a noise. That's a garbage is koan, that, by the way. Um, is that a, totally so did. You're saying that's this is also the sound of one story. hand clapping. What's it? A true story, then, is what actually, what actually happened is a true story. <laughs> See, the knowledge. What's <laughs> What actually happened is a true story? Well, I mean, that, you know, I'm just going to, and I'm going to say, and I know we could all be brains in boxes or whatever, but I'm going to say there was really some history, and it's not forking. There aren't multiverses. I know that might be disappointing, but, um, <laughs> you know, but I, I there's energetic conservation at least, are, are right? True, I guess my question is, then, are true events a story, or is the story only once we start retelling it? Um, so I'm going to, yeah, focus a little more on human stories, right? So I think okay. the way we retell it is the, is the story, yeah. But octopuses could tell a story. But I do want to say that there is, uh, well, so are all th th there's, the, there's the retelling, and, and there, is a, there are various versions of it. Right? There's the, you could say there's the plot and the story, right, which I had before. So the, okay. the plot would be the, the actual sequence of events. Okay. You know, and the causal things, like this happened and this happened. Right? The plot for fluid mechanics is the Navier-Stokes equation. Right? That's the mechanic that explains, like, Fluid to here, and it's going to be here in the next <laughs> instant. Right. But you know, like someone pushes, gravity's going to make whatever, like there's something that happens. Like a Buster Keaton, Laurel and Hardy. Does anyone know who these people are? This is amazing to me. Laurel no one. Hardy. Yeah? Laurel and Hardy. You know? Yeah. Not many people do. Okay, so these are the early movie things, yes? Right? I've asked people. People, people don't know anymore. Anyway, but these are the early slapstick. Right, you know, like being hit with a, the guys with ladders, you know, everyone's getting hit with a ladder, that sort of business. Anyway, no one knows about these things. Um, I'm not sure what the addition was there, but um, there's, so real, you know, real things, you know, there is an actual, you know, history, and then we're going to tell stories, so we'll call that the plot, right, if you like, and then there are, and some of that's going to be random, that's a problem, right, there's going to be just random stuff that happens, and when we tell stories, that's one of the things we want to iron out. We're not really great at that. Now and then we can handle it. You know, if it's really too much, we'll say, you know, the French have c'est la vie. Um, there are various versions of that in um, English. And this comes back, this is from Wolfgang Mieter, who's the world's leader in um, Proverbs, who's over here in Russian and German. I remember telling, telling me one of his favorite Proverbs of the last um, second half of the 20th century is and it's S-H-I-T happens, right? So it's a, I can't even swear in class. So it's a, and, and that's very commonly used and it comes from the GIs after the Second, War, Second World War coming back. That's the American version of C'est la vie. <laughs> Doesn't have, yeah. <laughs> it's funny because the English would use C'est la vie. Like they'd use, they just wholly take it, you know. They'd say that's life a little bit, but you would actually like give it a bit of lift by using the, the French. So, Story logic, the, the way we tell stories, we're not good at randomness, and it depends on your culture, right? So the Western culture is a little more about individ, individual narratives, so we'll try to explain it as a function of individuals. Um, okay, so that's, that's just sort of step one. That just means in retelling a story, you're going to get into, you're going to get it some way away from what really happened. And this, you know, so journalists are in here, right? Journalists are in here, they good, good, you know, journalism in general is uh, the, you know, very good people, right? My wife's one of them. And uh, 
they're scientists with a deadline, right? So um, they're trying to do this all the time. Opinions are a different thing, so opinions get further away. So, so there, here's the second big piece, I think, in here, is that there are better stories away from the, what really happened. They're in the sense that they will, they will go into your brain better. They'll be, you want to tell them, right? You want to spread them. So there are three pieces here. They're more engaging, right? They're more appealing to our story minds, more motivating to spread, and they're more durable under spreading, right? They're the, they're the best stories, right? So that you tell, they have a coherence to them that doesn't get broken down. You know, this is the telephone game. This has changed, I suppose, because, uh, you know, everything is online now and you can have immediate, you know, communication about something. So people, you know, the durability of something can be higher because you can point to it. Um, the gain there becomes, you know, how much are these stories fighting against each other? The durability, right? Do they persist? Because you can go and find, you know, whatever it is, a video on YouTube, this, this tells you something. Uh, so better stories, therefore, are going to exist for people like journalists who are going to try to retell, right? So you're going to distill it into a better story. There's this real one that happens, and there's adjacent to it a better one in the sense that it's the right length. Uh, it kind of hits on some things that matter for your culture or what's happened in the past. They're going to, in a, you know, it's a faithful effort, right? It's a faithful effort, but they're going to go towards a story that seems more compelling, right? And, and so this is a slippery slope, right? You can get into trouble because you try to maybe, um, you know, uh, augment something that's not really true or you sort of see something and you think it's true. So, so this goes, this is where some things go wrong, okay? And then, the, but the third thing is, um, oh yeah, let's do it all again. Look at the second column and make a better third column. <laughs> Let's see if you can get better and then get better again. Don't get worse. Let's try to do that, right? But you know the game now. Are you taking the average or the medium? Average. I will look at, I'll, I'll have to look at different things. If numbers wildly off, we should just like, like put a really big negative. So bad. All right, no. Let's assume I will do different statistics, and one of them might be the median. Yeah, because you're right. Your motivation is right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. These people are crazy. <laughs> That's good. Okay, so the third thing, so of three, is that um, better stories are, are sitting there waiting for you around the true one if you want to do something bad, right? So if you are into disinformation, then or or you have an ideology and you can sort of imagine here's the real story and there's this just many dimensions around it, like going off in many, many dimensions and here's the one that's you know, your political stripe and here's the one that's someone else's political stripe. You, know, you kind of move out in this direction, you move out in this direction. I mean, legal cases, right? Think about um, like prosecuting someone in, in a legal case, right? So the defense is going to move out in one direction and say, yeah, they didn't, you know, like the glove didn't fit, right? So this, uh, you know, it couldn't have happened, right? This is, they're going to argue that there are all these facts that people agree on, but here is how my client was, you know, not involved. And then uh, the prosecutors are going to say, well, st stitch it all together. And in some sense, I think they're going to go to the edge of the envelope of credibility, right? So they might go a little too far, but there's going to be some sort of envelope of believability around uh, a particular real story. That envelope can get stretched, right? That can get pretty stretched. And um, okay, so this is, I've, I think I've said this. Even this, so this is, the, this is the thing that I've personally been struggling with, like Pizzagate, for example. That is hard to understand. That is really a long way away from what might seem plausible. I think, uh, you know, and this is that Hillary Clinton and others are running, have run an enormous. I mean, it's just it's too awful to even say, like a uh, thing out of the basement of a uh, pizza place in DC called Comet Ping Pong, I think, and um, which doesn't have a basement, for example. Like that's a kind of a blow to that story, but doesn't stop people, and we'll come back to it. But it's that perhaps the only thing I can kind of get there is, is that the demonization of her has been, you know, been going since the early 90s, and it just, 
got her into this category of evil that made anything seem possible. Uh, well, maybe it's mostly it's 99% bots saying it and 1% people actually believing it. So that's a question, like how far can you stretch away from, you know, the truth? And we've, we've been primed at different points in, in, in history to believe certain things. I don't know if any of you watched that New York Times. Uh, it, was some, it was in opinion, actually, but, um, and I have a link to it, I think, on uh, disinformation by uh, Russia going back into the 80s. And the first piece, there's three videos. The first one they concentrate on is, they concentrate on the, um, this story, this conspiracy theory that uh, AIDS was created by a U.S., like CIA something, you know, hidden factory or whatever that was trying to create um, bioweapons and it spilled out and something, right? So it's like the U.S. started it. And there's various elaborations. They did an interesting thing where they, they planted the story in English-speaking papers really around the fringe of the English-speaking world. So in Thailand and India, for example, in smaller papers, just kept planting them and eventually it kind of trickled up. And eventually Dan Rather, very, you know, famous and stately kind of character is talking about it on CBS. Um, not saying it's true, but just sort of talking about it and trying to contend with this thing. It's, it's gotten enough you know, power for it. So we'll talk more about conspiracy theories. So that's a framing for what I think this adjacent narrative piece is. Um, and, and it's sort of a existence argument for, or an argument for the existence of bad stories, right? And it's just that there is an insane, there's whatever really happened, there's not just a few narratives around it, there's an infinitude of them, and it grows super exponentially as you move away from the real one. So you're going to be able to find better stories that will spread better, um, that are somewhat faithful to the real one, you know, truncated, they have to be compressed in some way. But you could also very likely find a, a, an adjacent story that is wrong, you know, but fits in with some ideology that you have and you can, you know. And people work hard to spin things, for sure. They really do. Uh, this one, hopefully you can. You're the one who said you walked on the moon when you didn't. So. Calling the kettle black, if ever thought of saying you that you're getting my way from me. You're a coward and a liar and a thief. So this Buzz Aldrin, I think in his late 80s, Gushing a guy who is telling him he never walked on the moon. So <laughs> he walked on the moon. Um, <laughs> that's a guy who worked on the moon, right? So this is, I don't know what this, I, don't, I haven't looked it up, I haven't updated this, but this is a guy, I don't know if they've asked this question. This is apparently 6% of American, right, in 1999 said they were fake, right? This is a, one of the more famous conspiracy theories. Um, I was still, uh, yeah, I hadn't been born. Um, uh, and uh, right, you, the, the, all these sorts of things. Where you go into the video, and because it's not a great video, you can see the reflection of the, you know, the best boy or the gaffer or something like this. Right? Whatever. There's some argument about. You can see the. It's a sound stage in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, I mean, and that seems sort of. Well, he had to punch. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, got to a real. He didn't have to, but he chose to. It got to a real, you know, this got to a physical situation. Um, yeah, that guy's been a, a real problem. The comments are pretty hilarious too. I, I don't think it's worth, um, that's the, on YouTube. Always dangerous, but, um, so you, you might want to look at them later on. Uh, anyway, so 5% were undecided. This is kind of amazing, right? I mean, this is amazing. This is something that people around the world watched, right? Everyone, anyone could get near a TV, they, descent upon this was a massive global event you know uh, and he, he said it's it's there's one full one small step for for man like the a he said a man but it got chopped out in the communication so his, his great one-liner didn't work so other conspiracy theories sort of in the similar category uh, JK Rowling doesn't exist we'll come back to this with fame the idea with this one and this is a Norwegian uh, journalist I think actually it's just saying that um, it just doesn't make any sense that someone could have written all these books and they could have sold, like it's not possible, right? It's not, it's not possible, which is a fundamental misunderstanding of humans, right? I mean, it's just like an, and social phenomena, right? 
I mean, one of the big things that I think comes out of stuff we've many people have done the last two is that the understanding that billions of people can be harmoniously wrong about something, like wrong, or just you know happily in agreement about something that you know if you run the world again doesn't doesn't come out that way. So we'll we'll show that on Tuesday. So the Earth is flat. This is an ongoing ridiculousness, right? That you can find all sorts of good stuff. Uh, Kyrie Irving, who's right now with uh, with the Celtics, um, interviews very confusing interviews where he's like. Hmm. Maybe it's a guy who flies on planes. You know, people take pictures out of planes and they show that there's sort of a horizon that looks flat. And they're like, see, it's flat. Elaborate arguments as to why the sun is round or, you know, a sphere and the moon is a sphere, but the earth is flat. Which is true in Pratchett's books, right? It's actually a disc sitting on four elephants on a turtle. But anyway, there's nothing under the turtle. So the Beatles never existed. You know, that's a good one. Look, website. Um, there's this one. Right, and here it is, right? So. How is it possible that someone could do this, right? Right? How is it possible? It just doesn't make any sense. So it's a, an argument. Actually, it totally does make sense. That's how people, yes, yes it is. Um, <laughs> that's how we work. Uh, phantom, this is a good one, phantom time hypothesis. Uh, so these years didn't exist, right? This is good. This is really well done. Um, these are just, they just didn't exist. And the, the claim is that, so we'll get rid of 297 years. Uh, this, they wanted to live in the 1,000 one AD. They wanted to see the clock turn over, right, from 999 to 1000 because that would be good stuff. Uh, so we're actually living in 1820 right now, if this is true. <laughs> um, so this is good to know. Oh, 1821. Good to know. So, uh, and it was, uh, this, is the, this is the claim, right? So this is, I don't know when this was made up, but this is, of course, the handles that uh, you had the Roman emperor and the pope at the time, and they wanted to live in 1000 AD and make a big story of it, you know, and, and, and have power. Uh, but, you know, we actually had to sort of, people had to kind of dig out all sorts of, um, you know, evidence to show this wasn't true because it was a pretty good one. You know, it was a long time ago. But there are these sorts of things, right? De um, trees help us out, things that hit the planet and, um, you know, records of solar eclipses around the, because the whole thing is a big clock, basically, the solar system, we're able to, um, well, this doesn't, you know, anyone who wants to believe this, this is not going to help. <laughs> That's one thing we've also come to understand, right? Actual information is not. More information, more numbers does not help, right? So, yeah. You have to be really careful with how you couch numbers. People get confused, you know, about 1 over 100 versus 1 over 1,000. Like the 1,000 is bigger than 100, so they go the wrong way. It's pretty bad. This is a good one. Finland doesn't exist. Um, just doesn't exist. Uh, Japanese fishing colony, right? So that's a claim. Um, East and Sweden. I don't know. There's one for Australia. Australia doesn't exist. That's just made up. Yep. Um, anyway, so, uh, all right. So that's, you know, there, there are these kind of fun ones, and then there is, you know, conspiracy theories where it goes, you know, into obviously very evil, bad, bad ways. And you can, because they're just stories, you know, people are going to, they're just, they're just in people's heads. You know, it's, this is pretty lightweight, actually. Now we've got the apparatus of the web. Well, the internet to, you know, add, you know, videos which seem to be evidence of something, you know, people going through, say, the fall of the, the World Trade Tower, right, the, the you know, 9-11, right, detailing how you can see something and jet fuel. And so, I mean, this, we lived there, right? So, I mean, I remember the first time I ever saw someone hold up a, it was actually in Church Street with a placard saying 9-11 didn't exist. You know, and I didn't, right. I mean, I, I, I kind of wanted to kill them. But um, it was inc deeply upsetting, you know, because anyway. So, but it was also shocking because I'm like, what, what is going on? Like, how did this, now I'm fully prepared. Like something bad happens and you know there will be this kind of flourishing of anti-stories around it for whatever purpose, right? There will be all sorts of stuff that will pop up and you just, you just sort of wait to see them. And what we want to be able to do is kind of quantify them and say they're wrong in some way. That's... You know, what's the, what's the vaccine? Of course, vaccines are in trouble. What's the vaccine for, because we have stories against that, what's the vaccine for conspiracy theories? You know, it seems at the moment we have like Snopes, which is like one website with people writing little things. It's not a big organization. And obviously this can then be gamed itself and da 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 right? right? I mean, you would think education would be one thing, so we should do that. 
public education should be a big deal. Um, but what, how do we do this, right? So CNN, I think, or maybe MSNBC has now started to show things where they fact check on the side. They try to put up you know, actual data. You know, if someone says something politically, and then they'll try to put up some real facts next to it. You know, and that could be hard to do in real time. But at least it stops you from just becoming a mouthpiece of you know, saying things that just aren't true. Uh, OK, so this is, this is, you know, this piece is about the, uh, the importance of, of, of the power of stories in, in, in what they do for us, right? And they, they go for all sorts of levels. Uh, parasocial relationships, so if you link to this, so cosplay, for example. But this is about how people become deeply connected to, to characters in books and movies and so on. So if someone, or a TV show, if someone, die, you know, someone dies in a TV show, it has, can have really quite serious real effects on people, right, in terms of uh, how they react. They react in ways that they would, very similar to actually having someone they know pass away. Uh, this is... Uh, this is a podcast, The Illusionist, which I quite like. It's Helen Zaltzman from the UK. It connects into this piece, uh, talking about using novels as therapy, getting people to read novels. And, the, and this is a nice part of this, right, is that you can present all sorts of things to people for therapy, like factual stuff and, and hero methods. But the, the, the power of the novel uh, is that it doesn't tell you anything straight up. It, you, you know it's fictional, right? So there's an aspect of being disarmed because you're just reading some stories, right? But you know, we take on the stories that, that we kind of wash ourselves in to some extent. Uh, and so, you know, that's what's there. That's at the individual level. And then they sort of zoom out and suggest that Agatha Christie kind of mo um, novels, which flourished after the First World War, were kind of doing that therapeutic act at the level of a, a nation. This is, and this is for England in particular. But there were, you know, so a bad thing happens in these stories, um, and, but it's usually not too super gruesome, right? It's not because the, the First World War, what was called the Great War at the time, was, you know, a, a, a horror of all horrors, right? And it was unclear it would ever end. Um, but, you know, people, you know, it was incredibly traumatizing for, for, for a whole you know, generation. So these things have something bad happen in them. But, and there's a mystery, and you kind of have to figure it out. And Agatha Christie famously very hard to figure out. But you know, there's, you know where it's going to end, right? They're going to get caught. It's going to be solved. It's going to be um, clarity, right? There's not going to be randomness or madness. The world will have um, some sense. So that's an interesting piece here. And this is just one example. Um, I mean, if you think about tiny little or, or small catchphrase type stories, you know, the, the um, American dream is rags to riches, right? So that's a little... That's a story that exists in people's heads, at least. Uh, the extent to which it's true and the extent to which people believe in it, both of those things are you know, in flux. Uh, but they're, they're things that make a you know, culture drive in a certain way. Representation matters, right? So um, hodology is, the, is uh, the study of paths made by animals, but also networks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is this, you know, we, we we worry about this very reasonably, right? I mean, and, and it's but it's an interesting thing that we do this usually on the positive side, right? So that we would like to have, um, you know, minorities and balances of gender and so on in shows because you know we want people to be able to see that they can do things. You know, that's often talked about in a very positive way, and and uh, and it's true. But then there's a dark side to it, of course, right? Where we where we we represent terrible things. Uh, and usually the framing, you know, and I'd like to sort of quantify this in a large way, the framing around these sorts of stories is just entertainment. Like it doesn't have any effect on people, right? And you get into a lot of trouble if you say violent video games cause people to do things, right? Like Japan has violent video games, but nothing ever happens there, and the US has them. You know, that doesn't make any sense. But there's clear, in terms of stories and algorithms and way to, to do things, that there's a massive learning um, process that happens, say, within these extreme cases, right? So, um, you know, this is, this is, a, this is a natural born killer is a movie. It's just completely a movie, and it became a uh, verb for, for the Columbine um, kids. Terrible thing, absolutely terrible thing, uh, but, but, you know, I, representation works on both ways, right? 
And it just seems in general, this is, this is where people are very happy to say, oh, you know, positive things, great, you know, like really good, you know, and, and uh, like Gina Davis, for example, has a, um, her, um, uh, what is it, her uh, group, I suppose, uh, works on, you know, counting up basically how many times, you know, like male and female voices are in um, popular movies, for example. You can do some stuff now with, you know, looking at faces, right? You can just do it more automatically. Um, there's the Bechdel test, right? So Alison Bechdel, who lives out at Bolton, who's a um, MacArthur genius for cartoons, for comics. I shouldn't say cartoons, for comics. Uh, it's not actually, it's another one of these um, uh, things that are not named after the right um, person. Um, is that uh, it's a test for a, a movie or a book or whatever it is. Do two, do two female characters talk to each other um, separately and not about men? Like, does that even happen in a movie? And, you know, so there are various versions of that test. Uh, anyway, she didn't come up with it, and she keeps saying I didn't come up with it, but anyway, it's named after her. Um, so you can make those tests, you know, things where people have to annotate things, or we can, we're getting to a point where we can kind of do some of it, um, you know, algorithmically, and then, you know, process a ton of data. Okay. There is a whole list, though, you know, there's the copycat crimes where they explicitly connect back. They, the people involved explicitly talk about um, this. So, so we, we have an awareness of it, but we're really focused on that. So this is, this is some aspect of saying the power of um, the effect on these, uh, right, the Joker was involved in, in Colorado. This is a book that just came out um, that goes more strongly, uh, perhaps, in this direction, right? So the written world, literature, so this is the how salt changed the universe, um, literature shaped civilization. But I think this is fair enough, right? How cod, you know, made the new world the new world. Um, anyway, but it's this, uh, you know, storytelling is, you know, it's this basic thing that we, fundamental thing we do, and I mean, it's how we propagate culture and so on. Um, and so this book is, this fellow, he's a professor at Harvard, goes around the world, uh, that's what he does, he travels around the world, goes to places where these famous stories um, were developed, and I guess somehow tries to experience what it's like to be there now, but I found this, uh, I couldn't really get past much of this because he talks about himself too much. Um, so that's a shame. Um, yeah, and the New York Times review for this is like, oh, this is fantastic, it's so interesting, that's the review there. There's a, just a tiny bit at the end, like, oh, this could go wrong. You know, like stories could, could go wrong. We could maybe get large groups of people to do terrible things. Um, right. But it, again, this happens over and over and over. And I guess the word story, probably in most people's minds, it seems a bit soft, right? But um, the, you, you'll see a lot of framings where it starts off with stories are for fun, da, 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 da. But they're also kind of important, you know? And it's, yeah, right. Actually, no, they just drove everything you did. Um, uh, that's a, that, that's, yeah, yep, okay, good. Okay, so I'm going to come back on Tuesday and talk about uh, these things. Um, I will give you one more piece here. Uh, there's, how much money? Oh, it doesn't show. All right, so this is a podcast is from On the Media, which I quite like. Um, and this is a, a journalist who was caught by, who was held captive by ISIS for 10 months. So let me just look at this, right? So he talks about his experience like being in a movie, right? And maybe, you know, we're too saturated by cult, um, you know, popular culture to, that that's a problem, right? So people see themselves as movie characters, um, right? And so this is why he thinks the most powerful way to fight ISIS is not with bombs, but to kill the narrative, right? We have to write another movie. Um, you know, narratives lead to bombs is the way to think about it, perhaps. Uh, and... So he, and he's talking about the French, he's French, so he's talking about they're making big mistakes in doing this. Uh, social media name, stop this and this, da da da, right? So they try to do this. Uh, uh, I don't I understand why we are so bad, because in France we don't know how to write TV series properly. Um, it's interesting. Uh, we have no imagination, we cannot tell beautiful stories, create. So it is a problem, right? I mean, the French have been wandering around saying, you know, nothing matters, you know, life is. Uh, uh, meaningless and whatever for a long time. And that's not a compelling story, right? But we're French and we have lovely food. So, and lovely architecture. So, you know, what's the story of your culture, right? And 
you know, because people have left the West, right? They've left their dire circumstances in the West and traveled long distances to, to join ISIS. Because, and, and not because, you know, because of stories, right? Because of stories. And, you know, now we have stories coming back of some people for whom that was terrible, some people for whom that was, you know, that was, they enjoy, you know, they, were, they became very much part of it. Right? Um, you know, what do people want, right? They want to become heroes. It's a little strong. They want to become famous. They want to be recognized. But um, that's, a, that's a realization that this is the case. But, uh, uh, yeah, so we'll come back to that. All right. Um, I know we just sort of have to stop in the middle of this, but that's okay. So stories are a big deal is what I want to say. Okay. All right. Did we get all the voting done? Yeah? Good work. Thank you. I'm going to stop that piece. I'm going to talk a little bit more about stories. I just have a few, you know, the last 10 minutes, we, we'll add some more pieces about stories. And, um, and then we'll have uh, uh, sort of the conclusion. I'm going to talk about complexification on Thursday. All right, so this was about the power of stories, you know, the effects that it has on people. This is, you know, I just, we, we started on this. Um, you yeah, know, very strong one, sorry. How literature shapes civilization. And I mentioned this one, for example. So this is this, is this French journalist talking about, uh, um, you know, the stories they tell in France are not working. They're not powerful enough. Um, and it's not just, of course, about story. You have to have reality, right? You have to have that if someone comes to the U.S. looking for a better life, they can actually find it, right? If that's the, the, the story of the U.S. has always been like that or has long been like that for many people. Um, it has to be both true and possible, right? So it's not just about this. Uh, getting into the effects that uh, these stories have, of course, we have the terrible thing that happened in Pittsburgh, um, <clears throat> I guess a month ago, it's hard to remember off the top of my head, but uh, which was inspired basically just by stories, right? It was stories about the, I think at the time, the caravan, which supposedly had terrorists in it, which is a completely evaporated as a, as a story, right? The caravan coming through. Mexico, um, but the that you know that event was um, as far as as far as you can see is all just about someone acting on a story. This one, you know, this guy's famous for um, getting getting the internet and driving up to D.C. to find out about this comet ping pong place. This is Pizzagate. Uh, the intel wasn't one hundred percent. He said. <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's it's. Incredibly bad, uh, right? But this guy comes to this pizza place, believing or wondering if there's a basement with children in a child trafficking, you know, disgusting, disgusting thing involving Hillary Clinton somehow and and George Soros. Brings a gun, shoots it. Um, no one, no one gets hurt in this this case. But um, you yeah, know, this is purely stories, right? This is purely story. He wanted to check it out. Alex Jones is involved in this, right? Right. So you know. <clears throat> yeah. Once said that Mrs. Clinton has personally murdered and chopped up children. Yeah, I don't know. Right. It's just insane. Um, but the point is, this is just a recent example. It's small. It didn't end up with a, a terrible thing. Um, and of course, uh, it, it will seem very small in the history of everything, but it's a very clear example of just a pure story making someone do something potentially very bad. So Gary King, who's um, uh, heads up a uh, runs. He's, he's a very powerful uh, social science group at Harvard um, Institute for Quantitative Study of Social Science. I think is IQSS. So this is about uh, looking at um, Weibo. I think it was. Must have been Weibo. There's only Weibo. And um, the 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 work here was to show that. Uh, or what they uncovered was that the Chinese government there seems to act in a way that is more about distraction rather than arguing with people, for example, right? So, you know, you've got, there's a lot of, you can have your posts just simply removed, right? They'll just disappear. You know, you write a certain thing, it's like, gone. So there's that. But then there's also just this kind of obfuscation and, and moving people away from particular arguments. Uh, you can also make the truth a needle in, in a haystack. This is from, uh, this is a, on the media piece from, maybe two years two, before the election, I would say. But it's about accidentally or, uh, or purposefully just putting out all of these stories, all of these possibilities, and it's hard to, hard to sort it out, right? So you can't, 
figure out what the truth is, even, you know, even if you're really trying diligently doing your research. This is from this piece. Uh, this is a, the, a Russian play from the 90s, uh, just putting out stories, supporting all sorts of different groups, right? Not just one group that's against this one, but supporting all of them, uh, because you just want to foment uh, disarray and so on. Uh, so this is a good thing to look at. So it can be done on purpose, where you're just crazy and you just say crazy things all the time, or it can be done very, very um, purposefully. Disinformation. Oh, okay, so this is a strong statement, I guess, but uh, surveillance state, right? So this is pretty good, right? If you have the story that God is omniscient and watching and is aware of everything, and you really believe that, then um, that's a pretty good, you know, this is way before 1984. This is, this is a pretty good system, and uh, you know, it could be quite, quite effective in, in getting people to behave in, you know, in hopefully good ways. Um, but it's an infrastructure that's maintained in the social wild, right, by storytellers and story believers. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I'm not going to get shot by lightning. Um, I'm not sure. But, you know, there are, you know, I, it is true, right, that we live in a world where there are very, very large competing religions that don't believe we don't match up with each other. So in, in some important details. So someone is wrong, um, which is interesting. Uh, so, yeah, so it's the end of privacy, right? We're worried about privacy now, but um, someone who watches every thought, that is... Pretty bad, yeah. It's not just, uh, you know, the camera's in the corner, but, uh, yeah. Anyway, so uh, the, and it is kind of remarkable what's happened now with, potentially with cameras, right, I mean, in terms of finding people and catching people. And, yeah. Uh, okay. This is an important part, I think, of, and this is the Ten Commandments. Uh, if you've got a really powerful story, you know, which is more than just, you know, it's a story now, it's a culture or whatever it is, or it's a whole, um, um, you know, with conspiracy theories, you know, you want a totalizing uh, way of, of thinking, um, you know, like Q, QAnon. I don't know if you saw this, uh, Mike Pence was meeting some, uh, I guess, soldiers recently, and one of them had a QAnon patch on, on the front. And it was all over the, you know, the picture's taken, this guy's got a big Q. Which is, if you don't know about it, you need to look up. It's a, well, or maybe you don't. It is, don't, okay, don't. Um, it is a, um, yeah, it is absolutely totalizing. Everything is connected. And they have some pretty interesting things, like uh, Mueller is really working with Trump and all sorts of stuff, and Hillary Clinton's actually arrested and has an ankle bracelet. Like, there's all sorts of stuff. It's amazing, yeah. It all makes sense, though. Um, uh, <laughs> So there's this, this is a very important part of the Ten Commandments, right? So the first four here are no other stories, right? Right, so this is no other, right? So we're really kind of doubling down on this. And then there's some stuff about murdering over here. But this, we're going to build out uh, these pieces. And then, you know, this is a sort of uh, in-between kind of thing. Like, that's just, that's, that's a good part of the system as well. And then there's going to be some personal things that you should um, adhere to. But this is, let's make sure the story stays on our, you stay on our team. So there are other places that have done that. So operating systems, for example, so Windows. Um, I used to very much enjoy if you put Linux and Windows together, I don't know if it's still true. Windows would be oblivious to everything else or try to destroy it and so on. It would just boot up, would find itself and boot up and take over. Um, and Linux, if you boot up in Linux, it'd be like, oh, I found 10 other operating systems. Which one do you want to start? You know, I have Amiga. Um, you know, but Windows is always like, no. Just destroy. So it's like a dentist is operating on the on the on the building. Okay, so uh, propaganda, right? So this one is uh, oh, this is from uh, Tucker Carlson. This is just a quote. I mean, so much has happened, right? It's insane. But if you're looking to understand what's actually happening in this country, always assume the opposite of whatever they're telling you on the big news stations, except Fox. But I mean, this is just a straight up. Everyone else is wrong. I'm right. You know. Yeah, look at me. <laughs> uh, but the, you know, you need this in your in your in your propaganda. You got to have this somewhere in your cult or whatever. It's like you know, everyone else is wrong. I'm a, you know, I'm the our, our approach is the right way. And then you just keep adding all these reasons for why it is. Anyway, no lightning bolts yet. Um, but uh, but these it's interesting to see across very different places, like where where it's done. 
Okay, this is again to say we care deeply about books and the power they have. This is a terrible thing, right? And, um, you know, there's the reality of things, is Fahrenheit 451. Um, right, we will, we will not just say, you know, stay on our side, but we will destroy the other side's books, right? Right. Um, I think I had that at the start of the course, right? Plato wanted to burn all of uh, Democritus' books. <laughs> just burn them all. <laughs> The idiot who talks about atoms just burn everything he wrote down. Um, okay, although I think Plato just wanted to burn books in general. Is that true? Like you like the oral tradition. If you're writing stuff down, then it was like you're weak-minded. You would not remember stuff. This technology, the, the kids today, um, <laughs> it's disgusting. <laughs> Here's an Instagram. <laughs> ah. um, so. I'll leave you with this one, I guess. Uh, rags, right, so these are stories of telling you where you can go, rags to riches. Um, it's an individual one, of course, in the US. Uh, yeah, so and I've, uh, we've talked about this, fame, right? So, um, right, so you have to have these stories for societies, you know, they have to re remain possible, and it can take a few generations for people to see that's not true. Um, you can maintain the belief, maybe, right? Maybe you can. Maybe you can. Maybe you can for a long time, but uh, uh, you, you, it's, it's not great to have both of those things not working. This is an easy one to pretend is still working, right? Because if someone comes out of some bad background, there's one person, you just tell that story. Tell that story. And we don't understand statistics or probability. Um, you know, I remember actually in Australia, a person saying to me, because where I came from, like, it's like, oh, the system works, actually. It was an interesting statement. I remember being kind of shocked by that. Um, because um, the chances are low from certain places. They're just low, right? You have no idea of the path. Uh, yeah, so this is a, actually, this, this paper is an interesting one. This is to understand if uh, stories in popular culture about rags to riches actually affect the way people think. These are hard things to get at. It's an economist's work. Um, but I think, uh, I think we'll, we'll have to sort of come back on how we're doing. Yeah, so. This, I, I realize these slides are kind of like they move around through a lot of different things. Um, just the way it is. So I'll talk a little bit more about this on Thursday, and then I want to finish with some thoughts about complexification. All right. Last lecture, right? Yeah? Except for the super bonus one of 7.30 a.m. next <laughs> Tuesday, which you didn't deserve. No one deserves that. But this is a cruel joke. On, yeah, so I just want to confirm, like, we don't make the exam timetable, right? Like, we don't do that. That just happens to us from Gary Durr. Everything, it's all Gary Durr's fault, as <laughs> far as I can tell. Or well, the president. Let's say the president does it. Anyway, it's just assigned to you based on your time slot. OK. Oh, and if you have any, it's a couple of people who have approached me that can't be here next week for whatever reason. Good reasons, not like skiing in Iceland or something, but, um, you know, the conferences and things. So if you have that, then please come talk to me. And I think that the solution is to make a video of your talk. And, but everyone, it's a, this little mini conference, you know the drill. We, we did it, uh, we had our mid-semester version or late semester version. So same idea, come and enjoy your fellow humans' work. All right, so and, and speaking to that, the instructions are, I don't know what time it is. The instructions for it, right, they're here. So if you need to, you should go over that again. I did have one thing to tweak, which was uh, that, you know, I know there's a lot of details here, but the, when to send it in, please send it in by 5 p.m. the night before, right, which is Monday. Earlier is good. And there's the numbering thing. I guess I'll send out the email again with all your numbers. I need to do that because, um, but it will be the same as last time. So you can just look at that. All right. Right, good. Uh, this whole website, just to say, this is our last lecture, uh, the whole thing will stay up. It will just be, there will be this 2018 version. I'm going to rebuild things in other ways. But this, this piece, as has been basically delivered, will be here. Slides with the whatever problems they have, they'll, they'll just sort of become more and more calcified with time. All right, so I'm going to um, finish talking about stories here. There are just a couple of pieces. I'll maybe... Just touch on the ones that are essential. And then I have this final set of slides, which is kind of a coda to the course about complexification. Just some thoughts. All right, so this is a little section here about the power of stories. And, uh, you know, we touched on a whole bunch of pieces here. And as I've 
said this is ordered somewhat, but this is all very developmental. And so this was, we just got to this, right? So rags to riches is this sort of fundamental story for the, for the US. Um, and this is David Brooks, who's often maligned by the um, people on the left. They really hate him. But, uh, you know, so he's one of these sort of New York Times um, opinion people who people get very upset about. But, you know, this was a reasonably, in this is an interesting piece. And this is way back before the election. It's about um, thinking about Trump's behavior and, and what's going on. Little did he know. Um, but this is talking about the national story, right, for the US. And of course, locally, people have lots of different stories. They have the story of their, their family and their, um, maybe their town or their city and so on. But there is this, been this, this, la this large overall story of, you know, you can make it if you try um, from any background. Of course, that's not true. Or it's probabilistic, let's say. Um, and then, so this is the rags to riches stories, but he's saying, you know, maybe we need something else, something about, you know, redemption, I think, you know, uh, more, less individualistic, more, I don't know if this will emerge at all, but it's interesting to see someone thinking about this sort of stuff. And there's a whole piece you can read about that. Uh, you know, so that's a change, right? This is a change from a rags to riches story to like, you know, like fixing up a, a, a disastrous situation. Um, and if you just think about even infrastructure, we're kind of in that category. Uh, so this is just another piece about uh, the power of stories, right? So um, this is uh, just, a, just a slide on a list, list of things where, where um, people have come up with stories that are not true and, and got into a lot of trouble. So many little pieces. This is, uh, what was this guy's name? James. It's good that I've forgotten. Anyway, uh, it was about you know, the history of this, this guy's autobiography and all these trials he'd gone through and went on Oprah, you know, got some tremendous success. I mean, this book was, you know, top of the list. Oprah says yes, and you, you get, you, you get a, a, you know, incredible book sales. Of course, then he had to come back on Oprah and say that it was all made up. So that's a bad situation, right? Uh, there's a, there's a Wikipedia, there's a, Wikipedia has lists of lists of lists, of course. I think they only go out to three levels. I think they have a rule about that. But uh, a list of uh, famous fake memoirs, I mean, it's really just something that we love to do. This one uh, was a Harvard student who just copied many different books, which was kind of impressive. It was a real tapestry of other people's works, uh, which, of course, eventually someone notices. Um, so that was well done. <laughs> uh, this self-plagiarism. So this was just sort of, you know, like epic effort. This is self-plagiarism, where you just start copying your own blog post from before. This is a, uh, you probably never heard of him, but John Alera was this sort of next Malcolm Gladwell, and we don't need any more. We didn't need him, but, um, you know, <laughs> He was supposed to be another version of this. It's like, you know, Wonderkind who was writing about, I think, uh, I think he wrote the book, uh, Proust was a neuroscientist or something like this, right? All these sorts of things. And they're great pop psychology kind of things. Anyway, so it turned out that he'd been plagiarizing himself. Like, he'd just been lifting his own pieces from other places. You know, Wired and um, I think he'd been at the New Yorker. Like, various, I mean, you know, there weren't hidden things that he just sort of pulled out from the cupboard or something. There were... <laughs> published online. Uh, so he also had a, he had a thing on creativity where he made up, he had a whole chapter on Bob Dylan. He made up Bob Dylan quotes. He never talked to Bob Dylan. I mean, it's kind of ironic because Bob Dylan made everything up as well. But, the, you know, this was just a sort of very um, ridiculous situation. And anyway, so he, he, this all got found out and he disappeared. Armstrong, you know, long time saying I did not do this. You know, like, you know, I've been tested a million times. This is a pretty amazing, pretty amazing. Um, and of course, Russia, if you have not seen Icarus? Has anyone seen Icarus? This is really a fantastic film. It starts off in a certain way as sort of a documentary of an American guy who's an age group cyclist who tries out doping as a, you know, just to show, to see what would happen, right? To, and has a crew filming him and, and all these sorts of things. Right, so now and then you get pieces like this. Someone goes, you know, I'm not a doper. I, they go and get doping uh, just to see what happens, you know. You can improve everything. Eyesight, you know, it's all good. Anyway, so uh, uh, that turns into a whole thing where they just uncover the Russian doping from whatever, going back maybe 20, 30 years. But it is really spectacular. It's really, really fantastic. Anyway, you should watch that. Icarus, amazing. Um, <clears throat> he got to meet Oprah as well. That's usually where you, you go to tell the people you did something really bad. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, so yeah, fiction that speaks to real. And I've talked about this before, right? So fictional works, the, the power of like, therapy and, and just also just envisioning what you might become or what things could become. Unbelievably powerful, right? 
Okay, random other thing. This is, uh, we have some work on this and we've, we've developed other pieces, not published yet, but uh, Shapes of Stories. This is from the great game of Australian Rules Football, which you saw some of early on. These are the differential, this is a, all of these little wiggles here are differential um, scores as you go through a game. And so these are clusterings based on particular shapes, right? So this is where one team is, you know, starting to really pull away and then it's a, they get thumped for the rest of the game. Uh, this, is a, this is a failed comeback, right? So the team on top wins in all of these. This is a comeback. It looks like they're almost there and some of them get in front and, but all of them end up on that side. So this is the, the tragic, the valiant effort, the failed comeback. This is, a, this is a successful comeback, right? So, you know, and we have stories for these. We talk about sports as, as stories, right? And you often hear commentators saying things like, particularly English ones, probably said all this, um, you know, the script isn't written and so on. So that was an effort here to try and get out the, the narratives of these things. And I know I mentioned basketball basically being random walks. So you really have to, you, you can add this story on top. Anyway, so you can get very carried away with that. Uh, but. You know, something here to connect to, and this is the work we've been trying to do since, is uh, say, you know, NFL, like how exciting are the games and how much, how, you know, people watching, how much money comes in, how many people turn up, you know, and are games actually interesting to people? I, I will say that, that and to add to this with stories, like after the, after the fact, you know, some sports, in my view, lend themselves to being able to be told as stories very well. So actually American football to me, NFL, um, has chapters and a whole structure, and you can be talked about in a very sort of serial kind of story way. Basketball, not really. It's a game you watch, and there's some highlights, and there's what happened in the last three minutes, and it's sort of, you know, it doesn't have a, a compelling, you know, sort of Icelandic saga arc to it. Um, <clears throat> baseball, well, whatever. Okay. <laughs> but baseball has the epic sort of season arc, I suppose. Uh, and then soccer, you just watch and kind of feel pressure and distress, and, and that's what that's about. Soccer sort of famously hasn't been amenable to Moneyball, right? It hasn't been something that's been quantified very well, and, and it just doesn't... I mean, there's money involved, that part's quantified, but uh, uh, in terms of, you know, tracking players and having all these ridiculous statistics of, about them, a bit harder. This uh, builds out of that work, actually. So Philip Ball, uh, who's a wonderful um, science writer, has been uh, for many decades... Done, done great things, written great books. Uh, so he talks about some of our story stuff in here, but he talks, this is, you know, if you want to look more about this, um, the story trap is the piece. Uh, he talks about um, music and all sorts of other areas where there's sort of a story aspect, perhaps. Uh, and his focus then becomes, well, you know, maybe that's a trap. And I think I've said that um, in various ways, right? That we like, there are certain kinds of stories we tell, and, and that makes, us, it makes it hard for us to understand particularly systems, collective behaviors, and so on, right? We want to understand a narrative around an ind individual. I mean, that's a, it's just very hard to understand system behavior without simulating it. Okay, that's about puns. You don't need to see that. Uh, okay, so this is uh, taxonomy. So just to sort of have a, a look at this, there's, there's been some history of this. So this is the, the sort of the great man theory, right? This is uh, the arc of the hero. Uh, and that feeds into, so Joseph Campbell's very famous here. Ironically, I guess. Uh, and so, right, so who wrote this? Of course, it's one guy. Um, this, this is behind a lot of, um, uh, you know, movies and so on, right? You can see this kind of archetype. And, and the idea of maybe three acts, that's over and over and over. It's a trap that links to Star Wars. So this is a more recent uh, piece. It's 2005, but this has been deeply influential. It's got a ridiculous title. Um, everyone, cats, I don't know what's going on here. But anyway, so... Uh, but it's a nine acts breakdown, and this guy's become quite famous, I think, and so you come in and fix up someone's movie or their screenplay, uh, and you want to see these kind of beats to it. Uh, this is a very typical thing, so the second act, someone dies who's important to the main character, like an uncle or whatever, they get blown up or there's some flashback. And you just see this, I mean, I don't know how you guys feel, but a lot of TV shows and movies are very predictable. You're like, and yeah, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. So, uh, so that's problematic. Of course, there are efforts to get out of this. I don't understand. I'm not sure about this at all, right? Irony is key, is sort of something that's a thread there. Um, and I've talked about narrative hierarchies, but this is a little piece. Okay, so there, there are a few things floating around, and they're somewhat uh, peculiar. So this is uh, all about... Um, I guess it's, it's an overview of novels and uh, plays and so on. So Shakespeare would be in here as well. 
It's this quixotic effort to create a taxonomy of all stories. It's incredibly long and really detailed examination of things. It gets somewhat painful to read, I would, to, to be honest. But a uh, fairly elaborate breakdown of things has the idea of comedy as being a as being a plot, but that's not really, I don't think that's right. It's a, that's a way of telling something. Uh, as I've sort of said before, right, plot and algorithm are connected to each other. Story is something that has a plot. Plot is the internal structure. Well, we'll come to this again. This is um, Kill the Monster, right? Unbelievable, right? Beowulf, we love this thing, right? And this is about getting back to where you were, right? So this is a, this is a survival story. Something terrible happens. It could be cancer. It could be, you know, all sorts of things are framed in that way. Um, rags to riches, as we've talked about, right? So, you know, doing, doing well. And of course, we like the other version, which is um, tragedy. Uh, quest, going to find something. Many, you know, uh, movies and stories written around that. Many video games, essentially. You're running around trying to find five things and put them together for no apparent reason. Um, uh, there's somewhere you go, somewhere, somewhere you come back. So that's the sort of journey of return. Tragedy is here. Rebirth, so we're very interested in that one. We love that one. That feeds into all sorts of things. You can, I'm sure, imagine, or come, whatever, there'll be things come to mind that have a rebirth structure to them. Uh, but, uh, you know, Frankenstein, right, for example, right, which is sort of one of the first treatises on uh, AI gone wrong. Yeah, anyway. So, uh, pretty elaborate, and, and it's not, uh, of course, it's not data driven, right, which is fair enough. I mean, this is just this. 30-year effort by one person to read everything possible and put it all in, you know, connected like butterfly things, like putting little pins between books onto something. Uh, this is an earlier effort, but this is just for, and for a more focused thing. This is for folk tales, um, folkloristics. So this classification system, I, I guess it starts around 1900, but maybe late 1800s. But it is one of these uh, taxonomies, right? So sort of just a big list. There was some, you know, some structure to it and so on. Uh, and you know that's the that's a an excellent start, but you could imagine going one step further. And that's uh, if you're interested in this, this is a great paper to start with. Uh, Tim Tangolini is a total superhero folklore um, champion at UCLA. Super interesting person. We just had him speak at our Science of um, Story Symposium. Uh, he studies Danish folklore, uh, but also Korean folklore, which includes K-pop. Um, does all sorts of things, but he had a, yeah, yeah. So anyway, this is about, you know, let's get to some sort of big data version of this. You know, you can't read everything. You certainly can't read everything across every um, language or every culture. And, and so this is a distant reading version of that, right, which has emerged. This doesn't hold up, I don't think. Um, actually, just from talking to Tangolini. Uh, but it's this, I mean, this is a real bridging of two different areas that's quite interesting, right? So the evolutionary tree underneath a story. Um, and this is for Little Red Riding Hood, uh, the, the idea that maybe it's, you know, it's spread out into all sorts of areas, not just, so Europe, out into um, Africa and, and Asia, and trying to find uh, the origin of it. I think there's a problem with, I think the main problem is that some of the, you know, some of these versions of it are trans, just simply translations, right, from the original one. So I think it's a little messed up. But the, in principle, the idea is fantastic. Uh, so fundamental arcs, I think, boiling some of these away. This is just you know, an assertion by me. So kill the monster. And of course, they can be blended. But these are really like the archetypal structures. Once again, narratives are always, plots are always, you know, there's some time involved, right? That's an important part of them. Rags to riches. So this is uh, riches to rags, right, going the other way. So Kafka's metamorphosis. You starts off pretty bleakly. You're a cockroach and uh, gets worse from there. Um, <laughs> you know, but it's not a, not a good situation. Uh, so uh, there's something you're finding, right? We, we love that kind of thing. Usually there's, there's, there's some, you know, it, it may feed back into killing a monster, right? There's some magical thing that will save you. Romance, right? Big part of all sorts of stories, except for um, Lord of the Rings, probably. Anyway, so little <coughs> linear algebra fun here. So this is just um, stories of the many. They're hard to write. They're hard to produce. You know, they're hard to sort of grasp. So we tend not to put them out there. Um, you know, think about the U.S. in general, like uh, pres the president is this sort of, sort of all-powerful character, and I'm not sort of talking about any particular times, like the president decided this or the president did this. It's always framed as this one person. There could have been thousands of people involved in, you know, bringing together all of the, you know, the thing that ends up as some decision. But it's framed in that way 
over and over. Uh, okay, so comedies, I'm going to say, uh, you know, they're, they're not the story, right? They're a way of telling stories, um, usually about connecting things that, yeah, let's explain comedy. That's always funny. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you guys are going to do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so algorithms for life, let's say this, right? So they provide these paths and trajectories that you do or you do, you know, that are, that are pre presented as, as paths that you do or don't, don't want to take or someone wants you to take or not take. So cautionary tales. Um, if this, then that, right? That's a very sort of fundamental little algorithmic piece. They, you know, they try to invoke causality, you're trying to sort of explain why the world is the way it is. Randomness is a problem, so we want to have as much of this as we can, even if it's wrong. Uh, so you know, it's all about how you enforce behavior, potentially. So, so there's some bigger college of stories, right? There are all these, these, these uh, it's some big operating system of sorts. You know, maybe that analogy is too strong. We do live in a computer age. You know, if it was 150 years ago, I'd probably call them steam engines. But, you know, it's getting closer to something that's, um, that's, that's reasonable. But these are competing, uh, right? There's a whole ecology of these things, and they're competing. Some of them are absolutely up against each other. They're also just competing for space and attention. Uh, and we talked about the ones that have, you know, a nice holistic structure to them. Uh, Wolf, Wolfgang Mieter, who's here uh, at UVM, probably, I'm not, I'm not sure if you've heard of him, but he's in Russian and German, and he's the world's uh, expert in, um, maybe I've mentioned before, in proverbs. He's the total proverb hero. Uh, and, and every fourth proverb you find online on something like Wikipedia will say that he was the, he was the proverb hunter. They should make a NBC show on him. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, and these are all little, little algorithmic structures, right? So, you know, don't do this or you'll get this. Um, stitch, right? Preparation. Look before you leap, but you have these anti aphorisms, right? This is so we have anti anti proverbs that collide with each other. So, right, this is, you know, jump in, do not, you know, jump in and do not jump in. And uh, the heart, right, the heart grows fonder, right? yeah, absence makes the heart grow, uh, grow fonder, right, or and um, out of sight, out of mind, right? So, usually these are after the fact, right? You're like, this is what happened, here's my little story for it. Okay. There we go. Uh, so hatchings, yeah, so let me see if this one works. This is a framing, hatchings, matchings, and dispatchings that an uh, uncle of mine once mentioned. Uh, we were at a uh, family gathering. I think it might have been a uh, funeral. And it was, um, he said to me, this is where families get together routinely. It's for hatchings, matchings, and dispatchings. And um, I'm bringing this up because, you know, I want to, if you boil stories down, a lot of them really are about survival in some way. Right, they really, let's see if this works. Before we rehearse, I have an announcement to make. Our boy Grizz is getting married on May 22nd. Jeez, another wedding. Life is like TV. Testing tells us that people like weddings, births, and episodes where a character dies. In the background. She's dumb. My heart! Okay. <laughs> That's lots for those who are fans of this. But yeah, I mean, there it is, right? I mean, that was kind of enjoyable to come across, but that was a long time after my uncle mentioned it to me. So three fundamental events, right, of at least non-clone life. Uh, hatchings, matchings, dispatching. So let, let, me, let me just sort of assert that, right? So we'll see how much this holds up in time. But there's survival algorithms, and, and they can be for individuals and groups. We saw that right at the start of, these, like, of, of all of this with um, the Agtar people of the Philippines. Uh, that you know the, the stories they told were about cooperation in groups, so on. Uh, and there, and, and I, you know, what's the difference of story? I, I had that early on, but this the dynamic paths, right? That the doing this and this and this can lead you to this sort of outcome or this outcome and this outcome. And some of them are well, you know, they're really true. Like we we know from our own experience that that's a true story. It's worth talking about. Then there are the possible kinds of things that could happen, and, and then. The unlikely, you know, like, you know, be careful when you drive, right? Because something bad could happen. And, you know, this is often sort of attributed to mothers saying this to their children, and it's, um, or parents in general, right? That's a sort of an old stereotype of that, you know, that being too worried about things. But uh, rare events, on our, you know, they happen, right? They will happen to people. Um, because when you add everyone up, they don't become so rare. All right. Unifying theme of existence is existence. All right, so, okay, so that's, that's a little piece there. I know I've talked about memory and turbulence. That's still developmental, so we'll come back to that. 
and that's good. Uh, I have a little piece here at the end to kind of uh, get at emotional arcs of stories. So how do you feed in a story? How do you feed in Moby Dick? How do you feed in, um, uh, I don't know, Beowulf or something like that? And extract, get, you know, get some program to extract the plot of it. What's the, what's the plot of this thing? And boil it off in a way that then you could compare it to some other one, right? Could we, could we get that uh, Romeo and Juliet is analogous to, uh, West Side Story is analogous to Romeo and Juliet? I mean, it's built on top of it, you know? So is there some way that we could do that without, you know, tricking ourselves? Or uh, The Count of Monte Cristo and uh, The Star's Our Destination, which is a, Kind of extraordinary, 950 thing. So let's, let's listen to this. Well, there's no reason why the simple shapes of stories can't be fed into computers. They are beautiful shapes. This is the GI axis, good fortune, ill fortune. They is the shape of the curves of what matters and not their origins. So we'll start a little above average, is why, why get a depressing person? Somebody gets into trouble, gets out of it again. People love that story. They never get sick of it. So this is what I get. Actually, I, I feel like this is just a little excerpt. So it's here. Uh, let me, he has some other pieces in here. And then he talks about something wonderful. Just loves it. He talks about some Another other shapes. Million dollars. You're welcome to do it. Now, let me tell you this one. Surprisingly enough, I've said it's depressing. You know, people don't like stories below, about below average days and people. But we're going to start way down here. Worse than that, who is so low? It's a little girl. What's happened? Her mother has died. Her father has remarried a vile-tempered, ugly woman with, with two nasty daughters, big daughters. You've heard it. She, Anyway, there's a party at the palace that night. She can't go. She has to help everybody else get ready. She has to stay home. Now, does she sink lower? No. She's a staunch little girl, and she has had the maximum whack from fate, which is the loss of her mother. She, she can't go any lower than that. Okay, so the fairy godmother comes. Gives her shoes, gives her stocking, gives her mascara. Gives her a means of transportation, goes to the party, dances with the prince, has a swell time. Boring, 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 boring. Now there's a slight inclination to that line as I've drawn it because it takes perhaps 20 seconds, 30 seconds for a grandfather clock to strike 12. Does she wind up at the same level? Of course not. She will remember that dance for the rest of her life. Now, she poops along on this level till the prince comes to shoe fits. She achieves off-scale happiness. <laughs> Now that's just been online. For, so we use this. I used this as an inspiration for our group a while ago, and I'll show you what we got to eventually. But. Um, he, he, Vonnegut had this as a, uh, I don't want to play, he had this, uh, uh, he proposed this, I think, for the University of Chicago as a master's thesis, um, you know, maybe in the 60s, and they said no, right? And, and he has a, one of his autobiographies, maybe he wrote more than one, I think, but in, 2000, in the 2000s, he said a whole page talking about this, and he's, you know, some real swear words, you know, like long swear words <laughs> extended out. Um, where, what he thought they could do with themselves. Still, he's very upset about it because he thought it was a great idea. Anyway, so sort of we, in, inspired by this, we, 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 we tried to do what he did. Anyway, so what he was talking about. But yeah, he, he enjoyed himself, obviously, with all of that. Uh, so Vonnegut, yeah, and he has an interesting um, uh, story of you know, success in that he was a, almost gave up on the whole thing at some point. He was selling Saabs. He was a Saab dealer on Cape Cod. And um, he, you know, he's written about that in various places. But he was basically done with the whole thing and and then some stuff took off so yeah uh, so this is another challenge like how do you get this out of something right this is different again to uh, that what I just showed you was emotional arcs the overall emotional arcs which we'll come back to this would be you know it's not plot but it's it's the character paths it's something uh, we had someone work on this for a bit we didn't quite you know get it all out 
Uh, this, this is Prima was the one I was trying to think of the other day. But yeah, this is, uh, this is time travel done well. And that's basically how you feel about it, I think, no matter how many times you watch that film. But I recommend it. Uh, anyway, so yeah, and this is you know, what happens if you have a jury for a whole movie. <laughs> Hilariousness, well done. OK, so uh, yeah, and I mean, even just detecting when a character appears, that should be sort of possible. Of course, if time is moved around, like Memento and um, Pulp Fiction, that's going to be hard. But uh, you know, when, when someone you know, bites it, for example, uh, that's, you, know, you should be able to see that as well. Right, so where is it? Yeah, so here's Obi-Wan, right, hanging around and then runs into Darth Vader. Inexplicably. Anyway, so <laughs> this is uh, another version of that, completely different. Um, uh, this is Andrew DeGraff. This is just a whole different thing. But this is a sort of 3D version. This is Empire Strikes Back, which is the, obviously the best film. Uh, and this is uh, Princess Bride. So this is, a, so this is you know, where all the characters go, right? This is the paths of the character. Here's the Cliffs of Insanity. It's quite a beautiful thing. And he turned it into a book. I mean, that's elaborate. Anyway, so that would be impossible to produce. But this seems like something, right? And then you could have the, you know, the locales and whatever. And then maybe you could create a taxonomy based out of that. That's possible. But this is, uh, so let's look at emotional arcs. So it depends who's telling, uh, telling a story, right? So this is um, one of the few New Yorker cartoons actually funny. So, um, so Ron Swanson, just a good simple tale about a man who hates an animal. Um, do I have, uh, oh, that's a shame if I don't have it. I gotta find it. This is very enjoyable, should be in there. Give me one second. Um, Certainly important. Um, no. Um, yeah. Okay. This shouldn't have been commented out. Um, Yep, just doing things. Okay, good. I know. Let's basically just turn the house upside down. <laughs> Found it. This is pretty great. Chris, I'm not teaching you anything. We're just building a crib. No, I know you're not consciously teaching me anything. I'm just trying to siphon off some of your calm, centered wisdom through metaphors. Metaphors? I hate metaphors. That's why my favorite book is Moby Dick. No frou-frou symbolism, just a good, simple tale about a man who hates an animal. That's enough for today, I think. Does the white whale actually symbolize the unknowability and meaninglessness of human existence? <laughs> no, it's just a <laughs> fish. <laughs> this is pretty much perfect. Okay. Um, I know, we don't need that in there. It's okay. All right, so Moby Dick. So the point of bringing up Moby Dick is it's kind of the book to go to, right, um, for... It's, it's one, of, one of the ones that people love to chop up when they do some sort of analysis. Uh, so this is uh, running our hedonometer thing, which I'm not going to talk about too much uh, in detail, but uh, it's just a simple way of measuring um, positivity or emotional um, expression from text. And so we're going to slide a little window through. This is a terrible way to read a book. It's going to be a window of size 3,000, right? Just go glom and sort of experience all of those words at once, and then just slide that window through. So you see all these kind of ups and downs. Um, there are lots of sentiment detection things out there in the world. Many of them are kind of black box ones. We have a simple one, which allows us to see you know, why, what, which words are moving the signal up and down. And so this, is, this bit on the end sort of shows you why the last 10% is not as positive as the, or is, you know, it's more negative than the first 25%. And there are words like, and I'm not going to go into these in detail, but you're missing and shot and poor. These are all negative, die, evil, lonely, blind. These are all negative, cowards, and shooting. Negative words, they're happening more often. There are less of these positive words. So these all contribute to drop it down. There's actually less of the word fear. That happens more in the start of the book. And there's more of the word sky. So there's going to be a, you know, a complicated sort of texture to this thing. But that tells you, tells you this sort of bigger story, right? Obviously, it's a story, but this tells you a bigger story about things. 
Okay, so that's a little word shift thing. So this is just using different smoothings. You know, does that kind of pattern stay? And there's sort of this rise here, and, and the, this is the whale wins, right, is what's happening here. It depends. If you flip it upside down, you've got the whale's point of view. Uh, so that allows us then to, you know, go in and, and just munch through a whole bunch of books. We have 10 languages. So this is Crime and Punishment in Russian. This is the Count of Monte Cristo in, in the original French. And, you know, he wins, right? So that's, uh, that sort of pops out. Uh, we did this with lots of books. Here's uh, Frank. So we have this online viewer, right? You can play around with that thing. So it should all be functioning. Yes. So you can say, you know, why is, why is this piece low here, for example? And you have to understand these word shifts a little bit, but they're basically word clouds for grown-ups. And, you know, why is this low compared to this reference one? You can move this around. Very nice. Andy Reagan was the hero who did all this. Um, you can see, you know, these are just the negative words. There are a few positive words. You can play around with all this. Very fun. Um, and then Harry Potter. So this is, you know, say Prisoner of Azkaban, sort of the, one of the few ones that goes up towards the end. But this is Vonnegut's, uh, you know, that's what he wanted to do. So this is all of them together. Uh, and you can sort of see, you know, why is this little piece so bad here, right? This is the first few books here. So we'll just sort of take them. You can just take, you can take everything, right? So every, all of the books compared and compare this one little bleak spot here. Um, so you see these words over here, death and dead and kill and curse and right, right, right. It gets a little rough. But this is a really hard problem with, with uh, many languages, especially English, is passing them into phrases properly. So this is from Death Eaters. Um, and just death, but it's going to be a lot from Death Eaters, but which we don't, we don't have that as a separate thing. But, you know, that's a bad word. Uh, so people, you know, it's going to push it all down. This is, this is a spoiler for you, but this is, if, if you haven't read it, uh, is Dumbledore bites it. Okay. It's the lowest point. All right, and the highest point, I think, is, you know, yeah. So this is a thing to explore and play around with. And then, you know, there's random craziness. It's a weird assortment of, <laughs> it's a weird selection of books. Harry Potter, yes. We have a movie one. This is not really published. It's online. We have an online interactive thing for this. As you move around on, on this one, this is pretty cool, actually. So um, I can't believe we haven't published this. This is some movies. Yeah. So as you move around in it, the, there's a te <laughs> the script is in the background as well. But the script, you know, you can see where you are with the script, right? You can sort of focus in and see what's going on. Like, what is this point? And if you, we set up a thing so people could annotate the points, right? So this is, for Pulp Fiction fans, this is bring out the gimp situation. So that is a, uh, what is a difficult, troubling movie? That is a bleak point um, in terms of how our algorithm, um, you know, our simple-minded algorithm went through it. Lots of movies in there. Okay, so that's all sitting there. Uh, so we published a uh, paper on this, and this is just some press that someone created for it, which they had some fun with it. They had a great time. This is actually from our paper, because Andy got excited and used XKCD font and all sorts of things. Um, so it was pretty good. I mean, it's, it, so we have this story that, uh, let me say this, say this. This is how he made a little hedonometer thing. So this little guy, uh, it's still slow. We've got, we've got Harry Potter. We've got the hedonometer here. We're gonna go. We're gonna go ahead and plug in, and it's gonna analyze the words in the book. Here we go. <laughs> Harry Potter. We've got Harry Potter. It's reading the book, plotting the arc. Things are getting better. <laughs> Worse. Right? Ah. Yep. Anyway, so Andy made this little gadget. There's a whole pile of books, and you could just come along and plug them in, and it read them. <laughs> I mean, he went to a lot of effort here. I mean, he put a little chip inside each one, you know, and it was it was pretty cool, right? So all of these, yeah. What is this, Lord of the Rings, uh, Dostoevsky, yeah, yeah, it's terrific. Anyway, that was great. Okay, so out of that, and this is gonna look like Furia, uh, you know, which is gonna pop out. I think there are other ways we wanna do this as well, but it, it, you know, it was a very good start to this. Uh, and we did analyze in different ways, right? We used SVD, we used some other, couple of other methods to try and um, uh, put, put the uh, uh, arcs together into their major, major uh, structures. So this would be, and then we classified them, right? So this would be the rags to riches kind of arc. This would be the tragedy one, right? Things are just getting worse. So these are just flips of each other in terms of singular um, vectors. Uh, this is uh, what, what, so we gave them some names. So we call this one Icarus. This is man in the hole. This is what 
um, Vonnegut called that arc. And I will say, you know, I mean, it's great stuff, but this, this doesn't tell you anything, right? Manahole could be just like it's just getting worse, or you're waiting for someone to come onto the stage, like, good oh. But it could be just things aren't great, right? It doesn't tell you anything in that title, like where it's going. And there is a forward, this is a forward phrase, there is a forward phrase that does actually do that for you. We'll come to that. So Cinderella, um, but we, you know, we kept that name because of him. Cinderella, right, has this roughly, this sort of shape. Uh, and Oedipus, right, starts off well, cast out, uh, things are going well, married his mother. Not so good. Okay. <laughs> you know, I guess they made these myths up because some stuff was happening in society and they needed to, like, Let's make some TV shows to show you you should not do that. Okay. Um, this is Andy. So this got written up at the back page of Scientific American, um, which was sort of a lovely thing. And then and there was another piece that was included there, which was like a, sort of the fractal structure of sentence lengths, um, which is pretty weird. Uh, but he was out recording video, actually, I think, for a machine learning course of, um, somewhere. Well, this is, yeah. I guess he was in LA. I thought he was going to be in Berkeley, but this was, yeah. Anyway, he went for a run and he bought, that's where he bought the uh, Scientific American piece. So it's nice, nice little thing for him. Uh, this is uh, an effort to sort of, so we use Gutenberg for this, gutenberg.org, which is an open source, you know, contributed thing. Uh, you can see which, which uh, arcs were downloaded, you know, the most, and it turns out to be sort of relatively <coughs> more of these slightly complicated ones. But, um, you know, I think there's, there's a, a lot more to do here. And I, I think one thing we would want to move away from is, is things that decompose them. Like, you don't want Fourier or anything like that, really. You want something that says, you know, it's this kind of piece glued to this kind of piece glued to this kind of piece. Different kind of approach. And ultimately, and this is true for socio-technical things, like some of you are working on some of the Twitter time series, we'd like to have something that says, here's the, here's the kind of algorithmic or the mechanism that's... The, the, um, that, that's underlying the behavior of this uh, time series at this point, right? It's like there's an external shock, there's a memory of that shock, and then maybe, you know, whatever it is. And then that memory's gone, and you're into some sort of background thing. I, I think we want something like that. So rather than decomposing it into just shapes, you decompose it into algorithms, mechanisms. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the man in a hole, and this is a way of talking about it that actually gives you, you know, past, um, present, and future. And, and this, I have been talking about this since before the election, um, the, the most recent election, sorry, the re most recent presidential election. So this is, uh, right, so Make America Great Again. It's a fantastic template, right, because it does tell you, it indicates something about the past, something about the present, something about the future, and, and this kind of shape to it, and in four words. Now, of course, it was stolen, because that's kind of how that character works, but uh, it was first used, as far as I know, uh, by Reagan and Bush in, in advertising in, in 1980. It was Let's Make America Great Again, so it was a little more cooperative. But this has been used by many, many people, like Bill Clinton, Ted Cruz tried to use it in the um, primaries, but got told it was not his and someone had stolen it, or whatever, this is madness. But in terms of, you know, slogans and powerful, you know, powerful slogans, fantastic, right? Really good. People make hats. You know, and I'm there, and it doesn't. So there's this sort of narrative hierarchy idea that I have, right? So that the, this is this powerful, powerful thing that that got people, certain groups of people excited, uh, and you really have to work on that part of your, you know. And this is just talking about, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, sloganeering aspect of politics, which is it should be a very small part, but it does have power. Uh, if you, Clinton's initial one was, I'm with her, which didn't really show which way things were going, you know, so, and then it became stronger together, which is better, but it doesn't, it didn't have a, uh, a sequence. Anyway, so, that's one thing. As I said, template used over and over again. Uh, mocked, of course, you know, it could be easily mocked as well, uh, but total madness, you know. No one seems like no one has really managed to ask like make great again like which, which again which which part which point in history was the part we're trying to replicate you know what about all the details of that uh, point in time do you want again okay this is just a few uh, notes at the end you know science of stories we don't have to I can sort of just point to this we we have a paper that we're going to write over the next year. Uh, 
connected with PLOS One, so it's going to be a foundational paper on the science of stories, just sort of outlining this as a sort of future area. Uh, maybe 20 to 30 papers will be will come in that will be part of a collection, right? So, uh, so, so there's going to be this pitch to invite people to submit to it, and then uh, they'll be published over a couple of years. You know, PLOS One is this gigantic thing. I think at some point got close to publishing 100 papers a day, which is absurd. Um, and so obviously this is a, not a printed thing, this is just something that lives online. And so making a collection is a very easy thing for them to do and a natural thing to do. Uh, so it's not really a central place for uh, thinking about stories, although you know, it's, it's really everywhere. I mean, political science, people, obviously folklore, um, and so on, communication departments, which rose out of propaganda, but they have an odd feeling to them. I, they're obviously, they've done very well in many, many places, but in terms of research, I often hear them say, well, we don't have anything we created ourselves. We don't have our own methods, which is odd. So it's sort of getting confused about what, the sci what science is, right? So it's about the area you study and, right. So if they'd made their own method, they'd feel special. Instead of the economists telling them they're not worth it, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so there are just a few pieces at, uh, pieces at the end here. Um, not sure whether it's too much, but um, uh, you know, uh, right? That, that stories are just this incredibly important part of what's going on, and I mean them in, in. And I know stories have a feeling to them that that word can seem make them sound soft, uh, perhaps, or like they're fun, they're kid things, but that's not true at all. Um, people are often th thinking of very very simple stories, right? Like this leads to that, and so on, and broken down. So we need to lift out of that because if you think about 300 million people or billions of people, the story becomes much more, it's, it's harder to grasp, you know, and you end up with things like climate change um, and no one being able to do anything about it because it requires, you know, long-term thinking and understanding systems of people. And if you just do something wrong, then it doesn't matter, right? Uh, you know, you know what's the I mean, being able to just identify the spectrum of stories, we have this project we're calling Story Wrangler, of course, Story Finder, which we've had for years. We're trying to build, like, how do you, all these, say, just tweets or any kind of media coming in, how do you extract stories from them? And then beyond that, you know, here's an event that happened. Here's sort of the plot of it. What are the frames around it? How is it being talked about? How do we do that automatically and, and sort of identify, for example, you know, conspiracy theories, like bad behavior, you know, bad things. <laughs> 